So we're going to take a look at the question, why is Earth hot? Now, first of all, we know that it's hot because we have volcanic activity. We have plenty of volcanoes at the surface, and that is driven by some kind of uh, partial melting processes, uh, a partial melting process that happens in the mantle. And then, of course, the, uh, the Earth is hot enough that even the outer core is liquids and then the inner core is solid. So where did this heat come from to allow the core to be partially molten uh, or almost fully molten in its outer part, parts, uh, a partially molten mantle that drives volcanic activity and then also plate tectonics? Where did this heat come from? Well, there are a couple of sources. In one video, we will talk about accretion. So as Earth accretes, if we take tiny little planetesimals and then bring them together to make a larger object, there's a lot of gravitational energy that's released. And that gravitational energy can uh, be converted into thermal energy. So that accretion causes a considerable heating, an increase in temperature that we'll call delta T, as the planet itself is born. So uh, planet Earth is it basically hot from its very birth due to accretion, which again we'll look at in detail in a later video. There are other processes as well though. So for example, there is core formation. We start out with a planet that is probably somewhat homogeneous, at least when it was smaller, but if it has a mixture of metal and silicate materials, those iron metal droplets might uh, sink downwards to form a core. And as those droplets sink downwards to form that core, then there is a certain amount of energy released. And that energy can be described by the very same equations that we use to describe accretion. There's gravitational energy, a form of potential energy that's being converted into thermal energy. And you can look for our video on accretion to look at the heat of core formation as well. So accretion and core formation, the fact that we have a metallic core that's segregated from the rest of the planet, uh, that accounts for at least some of the heat inside of Earth. Then there is radioactive decay. So radioactive decay. We have lots of radioactive elements, but a few, let's make this a little neater by starting with a clean slate. So for radio active decay, there are a couple of elements that are especially important. So potassium-40, it doesn't have a lot of energy that's released in the process of its decay, but there's a lot of potassium. It's a highly abundant element, so it's important for heating up Earth. Uh, uranium-235, uranium-238, and thorium-232 are in much, much smaller abundance compared to potassium, but there's a lot of energy that's released as those decay. And then there is a very short-lived isotope, aluminum-26. It's more or less extinct now. I think we create a little bit of it through cosmic ray uh, bombardment. But aluminum-26 has a half-life of 717,000 years. That's very short compared to the half-lives of these fellows. Uh, the, let's just write this as T1 half. We'll make a little table. For potassium, it's about 1.28 times 10 to the 9 years. Uh, for uranium-235, it's about 0 0.7 times 10 to the 9 years. 238 uh, uranium has a half-life that is, by coincidence, very close to the age of the Earth, 4.5 billion years. Then for thorium-232, it's about 14 billion years. So you can see these are all in 10 to the 9 year range. This is 10 to the 3. Very, very short half-life. The original aluminum 26 is now pretty much extinct, but there was enough of it that it could have caused or, or likely to have ca was likely to have caused considerable heating. Then there's one final source of heat before we go, <clears throat> and that is the heat of crystallization. Or in the reverse reaction would be the heat of fusion. If we take iron liquid in the outer core and convert it into iron solid, crystalline iron of the inner core, there is a certain amount of energy Q that is released. Uh, we can also talk about the heat of fusion, where it would be for the reverse reaction, the heat that would be added to take solid iron and convert it into liquid. That's probably the most intuitive way we think about melting things. So to take a solid and get a liquid, we would add heat and melt it. But we can run this reaction in the reverse direction, which we do in, in uh, Earth's interior, 
where iron liquid is being cooled, and as it does so to solidify, it releases a, amount, a certain amount of heat. How much heat does it uh, release? Well, at room, uh, at room pressure, it's about 276 joules per gram, and the total mass of the core has been estimated to be something close to 1.94 times 10 to the 27 grams. So you can do a calculation to figure out the total amount of heat. That total amount of heat would be Q, and that uh, heat of crystallization would be... So the Q would be equal to the mass multiplied by the delta H, the heat of fusion, which is this guy here. So if this is in joules per grams and this is in grams, um, the grams would cancel, just leaving us joules for the total amount of heat that would be released. And we could look at how to do the uh, calculation for how much heat would be pumped into the base of the mantle. So if we have, just to finish this up, if we have a planet Earth that looks like this, and we've got a metallic core, and it's dumping out heat into the mantle, so here's the mantle surrounding the core, the amount of heating would be related to the heat capacity of the mantle, and the total amount of heat Q that's being released from the core into the mantle, and so we can calculate a delta T. But we'll look at that in another video. So we have these several sources of heat, accretion, core formation, radioactive heating, and this, this heat of crystallization as the outer liquid iron core turns into solid.